Uh, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Thessalonica well before his death, but not without adverse situations that were obviously uh, forced upon him, but really, truly taught him humility. When we view this letter and examine and study it, and we actually learn about it, we're going to see Paul in the height of his missionary work. He's drawing uh, on his understanding, allowing the, uh, the indwelling Holy Spirit of the living God to teach, guide, and propel his words, and being honest with his own experiences along the way. Paul didn't realize at the time he wrote his letter that it would stand the test of 2,000 years and be taught in pulpits around the world this entire time. That wasn't his mission. He wasn't writing for literature for all time that he was aware of. He was trying to help the church in Thessalonica. Amen? That's a mission. That's a mission. At the end of his life, he was still on this mission. Hours, hours before his own death. He wrote his own final words in his last final epistle of 2 Timothy that would be carried to his understudy, Timothy. And this was a warning to the church in the last days to stay the course and to not lose hope. To not lose hope. Especially amidst adversity that us true believers actually face. What a beautiful understanding that we must absorb and that we must draw encouragement from. Because we all need it. We all need it. In our call to worship this morning, I'm going to read from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1-5. through 5. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work and evangelists, fulfill your ministry. He was writing this about the church, not the culture. The culture is going to culture. They're anti-Christian. Technically, they're apart from God. The Word of God tells us there's those with God and those apart from God. So the culture is going to culture. He's writing this about the church. But he would go on to say the infamous words next. Totally didn't even know what guy was going to talk about today, by the way. And he didn't know I was going to bring this passage up. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Praise God for the reading of his word today. Loved the truth of the resurrection. Loved his appearing. That's what that means. Faced with adversity, Paul persevered. This is what the gospel does for us in it every day. Every day for those of us who will actually trust in God. See, your trust in God is not predicated on how well your life is going. Today we embark on a journey through 2 Thessalonians. I'm excited to share such wonderful news with you on this beautiful day to understand how to persevere through lawlessness. Would you please pray with me this morning? Thank you, Father God for bringing us all together. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, for redeeming us to live. Thank you for drawing us together in fellowship. Thank you for allowing us to commune with you, to read your word, to pray together, and to grow together. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand your text today, that we read your text and understand it because it says what it says, and that we're not filling our ears with itching our itching ears with what we want to hear somebody else say. It's literally what your scripture says. Humble ourselves before your throne is what we will do right now. And we pray that you would write your words upon our hearts. I don't want to get in the way of your message going forward. I pray that you would write um, the words that you have written, Lord God, that you would, and written on my heart, that you would allow me to preach without getting in the way. 
In your precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, turn into your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, please. This entire thought that we're going to learn from today is predicated on the understanding of the return of Christ. We saw it in 1 Thessalonians 4 about what's going to happen at the return. And then 2 Thessalonians 1, he's writing again because there was some there were some things that he needed to write about clarity. And so then he segues into chapter 2, which has been a source of a lot of confusion for people. Um, and I, I, I guess I never saw it as confusion as much as I just kind of avoided it at one point in my life. But no more. We can't avoid the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word, and it needs to go forward, and we're going to teach it the way it's, which it's brought to us. Amen? So 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 and 2, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. If we actually look at the fact that Paul was writing this to the church in Thessalonica at a time when there were many false claims that Jesus had already returned, we would understand why he's addressing this, okay? And we know that this is written to us as well. Now, a lot of us would read this and go, well, how would we expect that Jesus would already be believed to have returned yet? We know better than that. But there are full preterists who believe that everything Jesus said in Matthew 24 came to fulfillment in 70 AD and and, and that he's already come. And that's heresy, honestly. It, It doesn't even border on heresy. That's heretical. Here's the thing, though, is that when he was leaving Jerusalem, he was talking to the disciples, and he said, these are all these buildings. They're, they're going to fall. They're going to fall, and they're going to crumble. He's walking to the Mount of Olives, and they're like, well, when will these things be, and when will be the return of, of your, your, your second coming? So they ask him a dual question. Well, when is this city going to fall, and when are you coming back? It says it right in the beginning of the text. So then he explains what's going to happen. And all those things fulfilled in 70 AD. So we look at 70 AD and and read about it and actually study it. We understand that that's exactly what it's going to be like right before his return. He actually gave us a template already. And we're watching people doing their crazy YouTube channels, and we have the Word of God. Amen? That's all we got to have anyway. So, So we know that this will happen when it happens, because our hope is in him and it's what we look forward to. But let me get something out of the way. I have to point something out today. I do believe we will be caught up with him. First Thessalonians 4 tells us that. We're going to welcome him. In recent times, we've heard a lot of people teach differently that this is going to be, we're going to be, the church will be secretly removed, lefting, leaving people who didn't believe a time of great tribulation for seven years, three and a half years. Let me just point this out. This idea would make these first two verses a false prophecy by Paul. Because tell me something. If we were all gone and the spirit of the living God would be gone, by the way, that's blasphemous because the spirit of the Holy Spirit is here now as the helper, as the down payment until the return of the Lord. So there's no way he's going to vacate the spirit. There's no way that can happen. That goes against Scripture, and it's not taught otherwise. But let's say, for sake of entertaining this for a moment, that we are all gone, and there are unbelievers finding a Bible. They would read something like this and believe that what happened? Jesus already returned. Therefore, it would make all of his prophecy a hoax. Just think about that as you read Scripture. Always get your understanding from the entirety of the Word of God, not even what a pastor has told you, including me. Read the Word of God. Corroborate the Word of God. I implore you. You cannot take my word for it. You can't take your favorite pastor's word for it. You can't take nobody's word for it. You've got to read the Scripture. You've got to listen to multiple sources. You've got to corroborate and and completely verify Scripture with Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. Don't read a book called Left Behind or don't read somebody's crazy ways of how things are going to go and there's going to be flashing EMPs and the world's going to crumble on itself. Tell me something we don't know. 
get your understanding from Scripture and you do not lose heart when things go awry in your life. We talk about this when people were in World War I hiding away with the gas war going on around them. <laughs> Amen? And you don't think that they weren't picking out their pocket Bible and thinking Christ is going to return at any moment? It was 100 plus years ago. There's always moments in time where somebody can look at it and think, oh, it's going to, hell in a handbasket. He's coming back. Yes, that's why he says, always be ready. The return will happen like a thief in the night. End of story. Now, live your life and quit worrying about it. Paul said concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to, together to him. To him, together to him. That means we're greeting him in the air. This most definitely means we're going to be raptured up to him. But it's going to happen on the day of the Lord. We can see this throughout the New Testament. He says the day, the return, we're going to be caught up to him. We're going to welcome him. What a beautiful, amazing day that's going to be. It may be while we're alive. It may be not. <laughs> you know, Don't worry about it. Now, concerning the day of the Lord, we move to verse 3 and 4. Now, no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. It's very poignant. Who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So let's examine three puzzling phrases as we study today. Number one is the rebellion. There's an underlying Greek word here. It's called apostasia. And apostasia is where we draw the word apostasy from. Okay, And in light of the context of this particular passage um, and this entire chapter, apostasy really expresses what Paul means when he talks about this. He says, let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. Then it goes on to very, say, very distinctively about the return of the Lord. So don't, don't let anybody deceive you about the return of the Lord. Let the return of the Lord and our understanding of it come directly from Scripture in its entire context. And we know this because the words of, of Jesus at the Olivet Discourse that we just talked about a few moments ago, about 70 AD, and that's a template of our understanding. But second thing, the man of lawlessness is the other puzzling thing here. Paul is very clear this person has yet to appear when he writes this, and that he is someone other than Satan. Now, a, a clue is to identify um, this, and it lies in verse 7, which we'll get to in a moment, so don't read ahead. We'll get there in a second. But the mystery of this lawlessness is what? Already at work. It's already at work. And that is very uh, common when we see lawlessness to both man and the mystery, while the man of lawlessness is still something to happen, the mystery of lawlessness is already what? Occurring. It's already present. That's why he said it's already occurring. We understand that we read John, first, second, and third John, the epistle letters of John. He says that lawlessness, it comes in the form of what? Antichrist. The Antichrist, Right? So what about the Antichrist? He says the Antichrist will come and is already what? Here now. We want to leave that half of it out because it's not sensational enough. <laughs> right? So every Hollywood movie comes out with something that's not even, barely references the Word of God, comes up with their own story, and people are like, we ought to rent that movie. I think it's about biblical end times. That's a biblical end time movie. I think we're going to watch it. Oh, look who's in it. Somebody who hates God. That's just got to be good. I mean, it's like, you know, get your understanding from the Scripture. It just drives me crazy how we, and even so-called Christian films, propagate the whole sensational thing. Quit working at it. You don't need, you know how you, just, you get sensation inside and warm feeling? You pray. You, you have a cup of coffee with a fellow Christian. You read the text. And you're blessed wildly. Lots of ways to get a real warm feeling inside. That's how you get a fuzzy feeling is you, you, you commune with Christ and his, his fellow people. Lawlessness is common. We see it. There's a mystery of lawlessness already at work. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure it out. Or Angela Lansbury. 
Another post 45. Huh? Huh? Murder she wrote. Murder she. Paul is saying that God has made known to us in his word a, a present lawlessness that will come to climatic expression in the man of lawlessness. Look, and Paul wrote this to the church in Thessalonica at that time. That's exhibit A. It was already going on then there. But we do know that it's clearly the man, he says, the son of destruction, the man of lawlessness. We also saw that he talked about the son of destruction when he was talking earlier, when Jesus was speaking about Judas Iscariot. So, so clearly Paul's talking about a person, and he will be revealed at the correct time. Notice that the man of lawlessness will demand to be praised, plus he will go against, quote, every so-called God or object of worship. What? He will go every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Goes against every so-called God, little g. That would mean that the, that the man of lawlessness would go against all forms of religion. He would glorify himself. He would be usurping all types of glory to him. That's something you've got to extract from that because so-called God, little g, or object of worship. Now, the crazy thing is Nero Caesar actually took up residence in the temple, in the synagogue in Jerusalem prior to the destruction, and he uh, desecrated the temple. And so a lot of times we see temple of God and we think church building. What's the temple of God today? The people. Amen. Us. We are the temple of God. We are the church of Christ. Right? We meet in a building so, so he's going to take up object and take a seat in the temple of God. He's going to do what? He's going to try to pull the glory away from what the word of God actually says. And, 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 and I'm not talking about misunderstandings or, or in, you know, a difference of interpretation. I'm not talking that. I'm talking about anything that really drives out. Of, come on, guys. There's a West Church that's been doing this for years with picket signs. They pull out what they want and it doesn't even say what they're saying. End of story. David Koresh knew the Bible in Waco, Texas. Oh, he knew the word of God. He just read only what he wanted out of it. On and on and on. It's always going to be so that somebody's going to try to take glory out of it. Satan, Satan taught out of the word of God. Satan taught out of it to try to, to, to try to manipulate Jesus Christ, our Savior. And he didn't bite because he is one with God. That's why teaching from the Word of God is becoming so less and less popular. But what's popular is not always right, and what's right is not always popular. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We have to be careful, obviously, too, of trying to figure out the identities of the rebellion of the man of lawlessness. Because you ever notice that we do that? We do that. Somebody pops up in culture and we're like, that's, that's the man of lawlessness. Yeah. Wait. No, no, not. That's the man of lawlessness is over here. Oh, wait. <laughs> He's over here. No, 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 no. Quit doing that. Jesus says he will be revealed at the appropriate time. Amen? Look, there's always going to be political beasts and ecclesiastical antichrists. <laughs> we see this all the time. And they seek to oppose the truth, and we must always be on guard against them, which leads, Paul to, leads to Paul's third point of this, is the restrainer. Okay? And you know, in verse 6 and 7, and you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he's out of the way. There is a restrainer keeping the man of lawlessness back, and inquiring minds want to know who or what is it. And, and Paul speaks of this restrainer in two ways, if you didn't notice. In personal uh, terms, such in he, he who now restrains it, as well as impersonal terms, uh, terms of when he says, what is restraining him now? So the restrainer could easily be a what as well as a who. It's impossible to know for certain, but since Paul is thinking lawlessness is transpiring within the church, the restrainer is probably also found within the church. Remember, he wrote this letter 
to the church as well as to us. We are all the church. When we read it, we understand that he's writing it to us as well. Amen? It's easy in any case to get to get confused. I mean, but Paul could be thinking that the gospel message, the word of God, ministers of the word of God, the government of the church, the way it, it continues to move forward, the spirit of the, of the, and indwells the church, or maybe a combination of any of these as the restrainer. But whatever the case may be, the restrainer does exactly what God allows until he doesn't allow it any longer. Our God, let me explain something to you today. But I want you to take and I want you to listen to, please. Our God is not a God of reaction. Our God already knows every hair in your head. He knows exactly what's going to happen, when it happens. That's what makes him sovereign. You cannot say that you believe in a sovereign God and then believe that he only reacts to you. He's waiting for you to pray, but he already knew that you would. So get in line with his perfect will. Is it hard for our brain to wrap around that? Sure it is. But if you believe in a God that is only reactionary, not proactive, then you believe in your God that's different from the biblical God. Because our God knows exactly when it's going to happen, when it's get, all things are going to happen, and he will return when he's ready to have it happen, and he will consummate his kingdom. That deserved a shout of amen unless you believe in a different God than the one that's in here now. You serve a sovereign God. Trust in him. Amen. That's a shout to you and a shout for you up to him. You believe. You guys, the sooner that we get confident in our God, the sooner we can get on living and not busy dying. Everybody you and I know are freaking out about everything going on. You don't think empty shelves are, you, know, you think they're new? You think they're new? No. Soviet Russia, you had to wait six hours in line to get your milk and then three hours to get your flour. You and I don't have a clue what it's like to suffer. Amen? Amen. We're spoiled. But that doesn't mean that it's not important. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person because you live in America. You're an amazing person because you're created by God, regardless of where you live. And here's the other thing, though, is that God selected you. He chose you. The Scripture tells us this in this chapter. That's hard for me to get over because I think, I, don't, I didn't deserve to be chosen. Why did he save me? He does whatever he wants because he's God. And I praise him because he saved me. In any case, what's important is we understand that he put it all together. Now, here's a few things that he wrote that I want you to hear. Verses 8 through 12. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. He will bring to nothing. He will squash to nothing when he appears. The appearance of his coming will do this. <laughs> Amen? The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow. Who put that in our Bibles? The lawless one is coming. Therefore, God sends those who a strong delusion to them who didn't love him anyway. Refuse to love the truth and be saved. The Bible is not for us to extract what we like and what we don't like about it. The Bible is not a set of a bunch of old school laws that um, aren't relevant today because that was 2,000 years ago and the meaning changed. If you, if you attend a church that teaches the gospel, 
the Churchill should be telling you that Levitical law was fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So if you open up Numbers and Deuteronomy and you read something that's really strange, understand that the Israelites were set apart by God to be a different people and they were under a curse or a punishment because they were disobedient. The Jewish people were disobedient so badly that once Israel, when it was split into two kingdoms, was completely decimated by one, by, by one country, amen, and then Jew, uh, D D Judea was completely destroyed by another country. And, and, and here's the thing is that we always think, we think in terms of, uh, of geography, you know, America's got to be written about it, you know, you know, how about this? How about you just focus on loving God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, love your neighbor as yourself, and start focusing on doing what Jesus asked you to do before he ascended into heaven, and he said, go therefore and worry and read all the newspapers and, and concern yourself with stupid things and your social status on Facebook. Oh, no, he didn't say that. He said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I've commanded you. And I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Your job and my job are to make disciples. That's it, to make disciples. We're not to worry about all this other stuff going on. Concerned, aware of it, sure. Worried about it, no. Why? Because it doesn't do you and I any good. You see that Paul was writing out, you know, hours before his death in 2 Timothy? Did you, get, did you pick up any stress from that letter? He knew where he was going. He even says, I've fought the fight. I'm good. I know where I'm going. In prison, getting ready to be beheaded. Come on, the human element in you and I know that that would be freak out moment for us. Freak out moment for us. What are, we, what are we tripping on? What are we seriously? Are we got to focus on what he, So look at 13. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through the gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. We don't know who's going to react to hearing the gospel. But we just got to teach the gospel. We got to evangelize. We got to witness. We got to be bold for God. Those who are meant to, to, to you're going to know, you know. I had no idea Matthew was going to react the way he did, Right? All a guy wants to know is like everything he can learn about the Bible. He's bothering Gage and I and several of the elders just asking question upon question. Jesse, did you ever think in a million years that you were going to react the way you did? Two years ago, I wanted to flick you on the ear. <laughs> He'd call me asking me some of the dumbest questions about how to get away with everything, right? And then, and then Christ gets a hold of you. Christ gets a hold of you. And now all you want to know is about the gospel, and you're eating, and you're feeding your soul. That's what people do when they respond to the gospel message. Remember the horse to water thing? <laughs> right? The day of the Lord has not come yet. With all the future blessings, believers in, in Christ eagerly wait for the, this moment. It'll happen when it happens. And the point helps to see the, Paul's underlying message, though. Of comfort and hope. Paul doesn't uh, want to frighten the Thessalonians. No different than God doesn't want us to be frightened now when we read about this. We need to be reassured in the truth of the gospel. In all the distressing events that will befall the church and have over the years, God is still, he's still all-powerful. He's still sovereign. Amen? Amen? Even when things seem the worst for the church, when the lawless one is revealed, Jesus will appear and effortlessly just bring him to nothing. Before our concluding, concluding couple of verses here in a few moments, I want to share a story with you, my friends. It was about 100 years ago in 1922. 
Henry and his wife, Ruth, volunteered for a very dangerous assignment. They were going to go to Africa as missionaries to the Pawns, a small tribe in the interior of Liberia. No missionaries had ever worked with these people before because, well, the Pawns were cannibals. Upon the arrival, Henry and Ruth, they arrived in Liberia. They set up camp with a group of Christian, African Christians who were actually on the neighboring tribe, and they welcomed them, and they let them live there. And it bordered, it was a boundary, and it touched up against the ponds. Almost immediately, however, Ruth comes down with malaria. And their meager medical chest is wiped out pretty quickly. And Henry, who I'll refer to now as H.B., from here on out, has this difficult uh, time persuading the natives that they're living with to go to get more medical supplies because the way, the pathway to get them had to lead through the pond country. So H.B. somehow convinced the chief that it was possible to skirt the dangerous areas as the need for Ruth grew and grew. Can't maintain a fever for very long, not the way she was. So one morning at dawn, a group of men filled with very many misgivings, left the compound and headed back to bring the supplies. About noon, about noon, one of them suddenly appeared in the doorway of the mud hut where Ruth was laying. He was out of breath. In gasps, he blurted out what had happened. One of his men had been captured by the cannibals and the, can- and the African uh, assured the, the two missionaries that unless the man could be rescued, that he would be eaten. Well, H.B. realized that this is all his fault. Providentially, Ruth's fever breaks that morning within an hour after they left. But without hesitation, he himself set out to the pond territory, and he was going to try to get the man out. So he takes a couple of hand-picked warriors And the small group arrives at the village where the carrier was being held. And he peeks cautiously through the fencing. And he looks through and he notices that there's two sentries posted outside of one hut. And two men carrying spears squatted outside in the dust. Their hair was braided in long pigtails and their front teeth were filed to a point. That would be the prison, H.B. figured out. He turned to his men and he said, I'm going in. If there's trouble, I want you to make noise, and hopefully I can escape in the confusion. So he was counting on two facts of helping him here. One was he was probably the probability that the pawns had never seen a white man before. And he hoped that that this would give him the advantage of surprise. The other was that he believed the miraculous stories of the Word of God. He believed that sometimes supernatural things happen in moments like these. He prayed as he stepped into the cannibal's compound, and he prayed nonstop. He prayed without ceasing. He was praying that God would show him step by step on what to do. And he just decides he's going to walk as straight and as tall as he can, and he walks directly to the hut. And as he strode, the two guards were probably too astonished to stop him as they just stared. And he walked between them, and he ducked inside the hut. And in the dark interior, he crawled forward and on his hands until he touched what was clearly the center pole. And his friend from the neighboring African tribe tied to it. So he pulls a knife out of his pocket, and he cuts the bonds. And the carrier spoke to him after he takes off his covering off his mouth. But he was incapable of making any effort on his own behalf to leave because he had been beaten. So outside, he hears the the shouting and the rumble of voices and the feet slapping on the packed earth as people are clearly running around, noticing that there is a guy here in in their jail cell hut. So he drags the man out, and as soon as he gets out, he realizes that they've all swarmed And they're all standing there with knives and hatchets and spears. And they are yelling and they are are mad and they are livid that he is there in their camp. H.B. listened for his own men to begin this distraction. And outside the compound, there was all silence. He knew he had been abandoned. All that he could do was think on his feet. And all he could do was pray. Because directed by the Spirit of God, he sets his friend down against the hut. And then he sits down right outside on the other side of it where there was a, 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 a skeleton head of an elephant. 
All the while, he continues to pray. He sits down, and the crowd kept his distance, but they're still yelling, and they're milling around, but not coming close. As H.B. sat quietly, he finally, the people squatted down in a semicircle facing the hut, and the witch doctor runs a few steps towards him and stops, and he holds out a reed wand, and it shakes it at him, and then starts back and forth and back and forth uh, between the missionary himself and the chief. And he's talking loudly, and he occasionally gestures uh, toward the prisoner. And H.B. could not understand a word he said, but it was clear to him that he was on trial. H.B. was on trial. He did this for about an hour, then he abruptly stops. And he comes over, and he peers at him, and he stretches his neck at him, and then he throws the reed wand down, and he steps back, and they all go crazy. With great ostentation, after laying the wand on the feet of the ground of H.B., he picks it up, and he realizes that he's got to be the one now to give his appeal. How is he going to possibly do this? He doesn't know their language. He doesn't know what he's doing there. If you know anything about Africa, the different tribes have their different dialects. They don't all speak the same language. Silence falls over the tribe. He sits there and he's starting to think about how he's going to speak in his own defense. How is this even going to happen? He doesn't know a word of their language. The crowd began to grow restless and stalling for a time. H.P. stands up and picks up the wand and, and, and instantly the natives fall silent. And he just prays. He says, Lord, show me what to do. And then he remembers Mark 13, 11. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for if it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit of God. He suddenly feels a strange boldness, takes a deep breath. He starts to shake, and he thinks he's nervous, so he's trying to hold it and keep it together. But then he begins to talk, and from his lips flow words which he did not understand. The natives, all looking at him, begin to lean forward. They're enthralled. He saw that the words, whatever they were, had a stirring effect on them, those who listened. He knew beyond a doubt that he was speaking to the pawns in their own language. For 20 minutes, H.B. talked to them, not knowing a word of what he said, but trusting and praying through it the entire time. And suddenly, as the speech power came, it vanished and stopped, and he knew he was at the end of his discourse. He sat back down. There was a moment of waiting while the chief and the witch doctor put their heads together, then straightening, the witch doctor gave an order, and he brings over a rooster, and he snaps his neck, and he pours the blood on top of the heads of both H.B. and the African prisoner. H.B. later inter interpreted this as a meaning. The, the, the rooster had filled the blood of propitiation. This is very common practice throughout man time. Blood has got to be shed. He figured it no other way. A few minutes later, H.B. and the captured man were standing up, and the pawns cleared the path, and two of their warriors led them out back to where they came from. Within time, the pawns gave up their cannibalistic ways, and they would work with Ruth and H.B. and the rest of the African Christians. And they would, in time, convert to Christianity because they would hear, believe, and repent in the name of Jesus Christ. A hundred years ago, they, bring, they experience something that is hard for us to believe. Terror along the way. Bringing the gospel message to an indigenous people. Are you kidding me? And one of the, one of the greatest missionary journeys ever shared in a book called Before They Kill and Eat You Today. I pay homage to my great aunt and uncle. Ruth Ann and H.B. Garlock. And it's stories like this in the book that when I read that, uh, I'm, I'm penetrated in the heart to know that God encourages and equips every one of us for everything we ever go through. Just like Paul, as he faced adversity, my family did too, and they persevered, and you and I will too. That's what the gospel does for each of us. 16 and 17, now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, the Father, God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. That's the good news of 2 Thessalonians 2. 
God's on his throne and we are in his hands. Mic drop, God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you for redeeming us to live. Thank you for helping us through our adversity. Thank you for loving us through our difficult spots. Thank you for um, uh, equipping us in every single moment, Lord God, that we are going through some of the trials that we didn't understand we would. But we cannot focus on the trial but the one who allowed us to go through it. And that is you. Nothing happens that, it, it, through your hands, Lord God, that you didn't already allow us to go through it. We don't have to understand why at the moment of suffering or why in the moment of tragedy or why in the moment of, of great distress. But we do have to understand that if you are the king of our lives, you are God of our lives, then you are always going to get us through each and every moment. We love you for that purpose. We love you because you are perfect in all your ways. And anybody today that has not repented and believed in you, may they do so. May they just say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for everything I've ever done. May you forgive me of all my sin stain. And would you please take up residence in me and show me how to live. I believe in you, Lord God. Help my unbelief. And for those of us who are already repentant believers, but we have been struggling with trusting in you, today is the day. We're going to give up our childish ways and we're going to spend more time with you in your word and more time in prayer. And we're going to trust in you because you are perfect in all your ways. In your precious, holy, and most perfect name we pray. Amen.